Hello class and welcome to this lecture on monopolistic competition in our course on microeconomics. To give you a roadmap of what we're going to discuss in this lecture, we're going to talk about what makes a market structure monopolistically competitive. We'll talk about the relationship and differences between price and marginal revenue that occur in any market that's not perfectly competitive. We'll talk about how profit maximization occurs in a monopolistically competitive firm and how to analyze it and calculate it utilizing graphs. We'll then turn our attention to product differentiation because that's going to be essentially be the crux of what makes monopolistically competitive markets monopolistically competitive. Uh, within that, we'll talk about trademarks and brands. And then lastly, we'll talk about the long run outcomes of a monopolistically competitive firm. So again, there are four market structures. The first one is perfect competition, which we talked about in our previous discussion. The one we'll talk about today is monopolistic competition, and then we'll move on to talking about less competitive market structures, which are oligopoly and monopoly. And those tend to have barriers to entry that we don't see in perfect competition and monopolistic competition. The big difference for a monopolistically competitive firm. So again, we talked about the three characteristics that essentially separate these four market structures from each other. The first one is how many buyers and sellers participate in the market. The second one has to do with whether products are differentiated or not. And the third one has to do with the difficulty it is it takes to enter the industry as a new firm. For a monopolistically competitive market, the big difference between this and perfect competition is the ability to differentiate products. Does that mean that the product is different? Not necessarily, but we can convince individual consumers that the product is different even when it's the same through branding and trademarks, which is something we'll talk about later on. But Monopolistically competitive market structures still have many buyers and sellers. So do they have as many firms as a perfectly competitive industry? Probably not, but they still have a substantial number of par uh, participants in the system, both from a buyer perspective and a seller perspective. And it's still in easy to enter the industry. So again, is it easy to be successful? No, but, is it, but it's easy to enter the industry as a new firm. And with this differentiation, the big difference between perfect competition and monopolistic competition is that a firm in a monopolistically competitive market structure has the ability to set its own price. They have market power through this differentiation that allows for them to set a price that they are willing and able to sell at that maximizes their profits instead of taking the price that's given to them by the market equilibrium and effectively just uh, charging that price and deciding to produce based on how much they can make, or the most they can make based on the price that's given to them. Monopolistically competitive market structure and monopoly and oligopoly, even though we won't really use grass for oligopoly, we'll use payoff matrices and game theory for that uh, unit coming up. But the biggest difference between a perfectly competitive market structure in terms of how we analyze it graphically versus a monopolistically competitive firm or market is that marginal revenue and demand will be divorced in this case. They'll be separate. Uh, in perfect competition, because you were charging the same price for every single unit that you sold, Marginal revenue was just the same as price, and so we had a horizontal demand curve, and it essentially was the same as marginal revenue. When it comes to a monopolistically competitive market structure, the difference that occurs is that we have a downward sloping demand curve again. That is, is that certain people really want this specific version or iteration of a good or service and other people will be willing to buy it but at different price levels they get different levels of utility or satisfaction from it which is something that we'll talk about uh, moving forward into uh, uh, later units in the course but 
because of this downward sloping demand curve, there's a trade-off that occurs. When you lower the price, you lower the marginal revenue. So let's say that you sell one unit of a good or service at $5.50. And then you sell the second unit for five dollars now the difference is is that it's not that we're selling the unit for five dollars just the second unit we're now selling both units for five dollars so before when you sold the first unit you made five dollars and fifty cents because before you made nothing so essentially your marginal revenue is still going to be the same as price however now when you lower the price to five dollars to get that second additional uh, unit sold, you now only have a total revenue of ten dollars because you're not charging the first person five fifty. You're charging the first person five dollars, just like you're charging the second person five dollars. And so when that happens, you have a marginal revenue at that point of ten dollars minus five fifty, which is only four dollars and fifty cents. So your marginal revenue is actually less with the second unit than it was before with the higher price. Furthermore, if you lower the price to $4.50, you then sell a third unit. But again, all three consumers are now gonna get it at that $4.50 price. And so as a result, your marginal revenue is gonna now be 450 times three, which is actually $13.50 minus ten dollars so your marginal revenue is now only 350 and that will keep going and going and going until the point where we sell the sixth or seventh unit of the good or service and our actual marginal revenue will be negative at that point we'll actually make more revenue by selling the sixth unit than we will by selling the seventh unit because at that point the trade-off to get that additional consumer results in a net negative because you're giving up all of the previous revenue. So let's say that we're charging $3 for six units. Well, if we're charging $3 for six units, well, that means that we're making $18. But when we charge $2.50, we now lose 50 cents for the first six customers in order to gain $2.50 from the seventh customer. Well, if you're losing 50 cents times six customers, that means you're losing $3 just to gain $2.50. And when that's the case, you end up losing 50 cents in overall total revenue. So marginal revenue, the additional revenue from selling one additional unit of a good or service, is going to decrease at a rate that is faster than the decrease in price. And they are not the same concept anymore. So before with perfectly competitive markets, we had a situation where marginal revenue and price were the same. Now marginal revenue and price are going to be different. And the question then is, is where is price being determined from? And the answer is, is that price is coming from the demand curve itself. So price is always determined by demand. So even though marginal revenue is $4 and $4 at three units, we're still charging $5 for that product and the marginal revenue only reflects the additional revenue that we're getting from that additional unit that we're selling the important thing to take away from this though is that profit maximization again always occurs where marginal revenue equals marginal cost and so our profit maximizing level of output will still be determined that way but it won't be as simple as just looking at the demand curve for everything we'll have to actually use both curves to determine the price and the quantity. Before we already knew what the price was and we were just finding quantity. Now we have the task of finding both. So again, profit maximizing is still gonna be at the point where marginal revenue equals marginal costs. The difference now is that we have to take into consideration the price and marginal revenue as two different things. So the profit maximizing level of output in this case of producing cafe lattes is going to be at the point where the marginal revenue curve that is downward sloping in that grayish blue versus the, the deep blue is going to be intersecting the marginal cur cost curve at some point. And that point specifically is going to be our profit maximizing level of output.
no longer is it going to be where the demand curve intersects the marginal cost curve. That will give us a different answer and an incorrect answer. So if point A is the profit maximizing level of output point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost as indicated by both graphs, then five cafe lattes is going to be the profit maximizing level of production for that firm. The question now is, what is the price? If you were going to just say, well, let's just go over and say it's a dollar fifty, you would be wrong. The problem there is that that's marginal revenue. That's saying that the company or the firm made a dollar fifty on that fifth cafe latte in terms of total revenue over what they would have made by selling only four cafe lattes. But that's not actually what the person paid for it. The person that's paying for it is paying as it pertains to the demand curve. And so in order for us to determine the profit maximizing price, we have to take that point A, go up to point B, which is the same point on the demand curve at the same level of quantity. So again, at five cafe lattes, point A and point B are kind of, going to be in that same line of sight but the actual answer for price is going to be point b so we have to go from that a intersection point up to the demand curve and over to the left and that point is the actual profit maximizing price so the firm will maximize profits at the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost which is going to be at five cafe lattes and a price of three dollars and fifty cents now the right graph shows us the average total cost curve which i told you before in previous lectures is what determines whether or not the firm is making money or not oh, again if it's in the short run and the firm's losing money then we'd have to apply the shutdown rule and if we're making money we want to know how much so again profit is just price minus average total cost at that profit maximizing level of output times the profit maximizing level of output so we know now that the profit maximizing price is three dollars and fifty cents average total cost at that five cafe latte point is two dollars and fifty cents which means that the firm is making money because price is higher than average total cost how much money it's just going to be the difference between price and average total cost times the number of lattes that they produce so since they're selling them for 350 that costs them 250 they're making a dollar per unit and if they're making five units they're making five dollars in profit so all of these things are important to take into consideration because they're things that you'll be assessed on it's important to know one that marginal revenue equals marginal cost determines the profit maximizing level of output in this case, unlike prof, uh, excuse me, perfect competition, we have to go up to the demand curve to determine the price. But again, to determine whether or not the firm is making money, we compare price to average total cost at that profit maximizing level of output point. And if the firm is, if price is higher than ATC at that point, then the firm is making positive profit. If it's the same, they're breaking even. If it's negative, then they are losing money. So the question then becomes, how does a firm differentiate their product? So the firm can take a couple of uh, routes for this. The first one is brand management. So brand management is just the actions taken by a firm to maintain product differentiation over time. So if they decide to put their logo on something or how they basically go about maintaining the appearance of the brand. So Apple, notwithstanding just their trademark, also usually puts their products in nice looking packaging, nice boxes. Um, the exterior tends to have a more uh, bougie type of finish to it because of the, for lack of a better word, because they want to appear that they have this this higher standard of value and that allows for them to differentiate from their competitors and in a way apple sometimes has inferior products because of the fact that 
uh, they limit the amount of storage and RAM that are in their phones or in their uh, MacBooks because of the fact that it allows for them to have higher margins because of how closed and tightly uh, kept they keep their hardware and those processes. So it's by design. Additionally, you have marketing, which is just all the, the activities needed to sell a good or service to a consumer. So uh, now if an Apple product was sitting in a box on a shelf next to a Samsung, then you might actually care about the packaging in terms of whether or not you buy the product. But generally speaking, in those types of purchases, you already you've made the purchase before you actually get the box so the box is more about the brand than about the marketing but commercials are marketing uh packaging of other products and stores that are actually on a shelf side by side with their competitors is marketing uh instagram and influencing is now becoming a more prevalent form of marketing to the to much to my chagrin but another interesting type of marketing is data marketing so because of social media and uh, websites and cookies on your browser we now have a lot of information at our disposal where we can micro target marketing to people who have a higher propensity to buy the product instead of just spending money on every single human being on like a traditional billboard or super bowl commercial another way in which a firm can differentiate its product and it's pretty important if it has one is a trademark so a trademark is a form of intellectual property now intellectual property has been around since the constitution in fact copyrights and patents have been built into the constitution or built into it it's in article one essentially so but even before the bill of rights it was there now patents are going to be important in oligopolies and monopolies and you could have a patent on something that allows for you to be in a ubiquitous space and have a little bit of an advantage but generally speaking we focus on it in in more of a restricted type of market structure meanwhile trademarks are intellectual property but they're actually governed under the commerce clause of the constitution and didn't really become a federally protected type of ip uh, until the 1940s when the lanham act was passed so what is a trademark you might know what it is you might see the r with the circle around it or a tm attached to something that you've bought that's associated with a brand or a sports team or even the college but basically it's a unique indicator of source origin sponsorship or affiliation of a good or service so what does that mean it's basically an indicator of a origin or source of something and the reason why it exists wasn't so firms could make a ton of money by having a brand or a logo it was really just there for the protection of the consumer so if you go into a grocery store and you want to buy a can of coca-cola you know because it has the image of coca-cola that it's not motor oil inside and you don't want people and it also allows for an individual consumer to take less time when they're purchasing products so it's from an efficiency standpoint it's economically beneficial from a safety standpoint it's economic benef economically beneficial but nowadays it's economically beneficial for the company if it builds a strong enough brand or trademark uh, to basically um, have an extra arm of value in their company an example of this would be looking at the world's most valuable trademark so uh, this data is from 2019 from Forbes magazine and the most valuable trademark in the world is Google so Google's trademark is estimated to have value of 44.3 billion dollars so that is not only the name of the product and the logo of the product which also is protected by copyright law to a certain extent but it's also the goodwill and reputation of Google as a business. In fact, if you transfer a trademark to somebody else without the goodwill and reputation, it doesn't mean anything. It's a very weird legal uh, hoop that you have to jump through, but it's something that is in the um, codification of transfers and licenses of trademarks. 
The second most valuable trademark is Microsoft, followed by Walmart and IBM tied for third, and then Vodafone, a telecommunications company in Europe and Central America, is worth is fifth. And then you go down to Bank of America, General Electric, Apple, Wells Fargo, for how long, I don't know, and AT&T. So my guess is because they're some of the world's most valuable trademarks that outside of maybe Vodafone, um, you probably know what their logos look like just by looking at the name. So Google, you've got your red, yellow, and blue lettering for Google. Microsoft, you have... Uh, the M or just maybe even the Windows logo or something like that. Walmart, their little minimalist star or the W and the original star between the wall and the Mart. IBM, it's the blue I, B, and M with like kind of the dot build. Uh, Bank of America, it's red, white, and blue uh, logo. GE, it's the little cursive GE in a circle. Apple, the partially bitten Apple, Wells Fargo, probably a carriage of some sort, or people ripping people off, and then AT&T, their little blue earth thing with the white. Uh, you probably just can en envision those just by looking at the name, and that's pretty much what goes into a strong trademark. Surprising to me that Coca-Cola isn't up there because that's one of the most well-known trademarks, but it's not the most valuable necessarily. In terms of brands, though, Coca-Cola is in the top. So, again, trademarks and brands are different. Trademarks is the actual intellectual property that associates with the goodwill and reputation and the logo and the name itself. A brand encompasses everything else. It encompasses the marketing. It encompasses the kind of je ne sais quoi it includes all of the cachet and fanfare that people have built up in the community in marketing and social media and business to basically give it a value in its company and so apple has the highest value there apple is worth about a trillion dollars in terms of the stock market, but in terms of their actual brand itself, not including necessarily the actual products, is $205 billion. That's followed up by Google and Microsoft and Amazon, then Facebook, then Coke, Samsung, Disney, Toyota, and McDonald's. So this might associate more with kind of what you as a consumer would think about in terms of value versus the other one, which is focusing more in terms of the value of a trademark as it pertains to intellectual property. Both of these are important. They aren't necessarily the same, um, but you can see how much economic value a brand or a um trademark can give you and that's not even focusing on the product itself so like apple could have a junk product but because of the fact that their brand and marketing is so strong they could differentiate themselves from their competitors and that's kind of one of the key takeaways and benefits of having a strong solid take mark uh, trademark is now there are two types of differentiation that we can talk about the first one is vertical differentiation so vertical differentiation is just essentially making your product better than your competitor's product in terms of usefulness. So maybe battery life is longer or it lasts longer before it breaks down or you're giving them a higher quantity for a lower price or it really does just have more usefulness than your competitor's product. That is vertical differentiation. That is kind of what most people aim for in terms of just trying to be a better product or as they say, building a better mousetrap. Uh, you can compare that though to horizontal differentiation. Horizontal differentiation is basically just a situation where you are making the product more niche focused. It has a tweak to it that's specifically focusing on one smaller population of the consumer market. And so it makes it better for some people and it makes it worse for other people. Um, so you can't really distinctly order it or rank it while you can with vertical differentiation. For horizontal differentiation, 
I might order it differently than somebody else does or because of the fact that, well, maybe I have blonde hair and I need shampoo specifically for blonde hair or blonde highlights. Or maybe I am a vanilla ice cream person and someone else is a chocolate ice cream person. So my effective ranking is different than somebody else's, but it's still an important differentiation to make because if you can cater to that specific population that someone else may not be, then there's a lot of money that's, that could be made in that, in that specific space. Now, go, again, going back to long run situations, monopolistically competitive firms and perfectly competitive firms both in the long run are going to assume to make break-even profits or zero profits now just like before so i didn't talk about it but the shutdown rule that applies for perfect competition also applies in the short run for a monopolistically competitive firms. so just because we did an example that shows that monopolistically competitive firms are uh, positively profiting in that cafe latte example doesn't mean they lose money in certain circumstances and you would use the same tools that we learned in previous lectures about the shutdown rule. If price is higher than average variable cost, you stay in business. If it's less than, you go out of business and you shut down. Now, just like with perfectly competitive markets, you're going to have a similar outcome in terms of your profitability. The difference for a monopolistically competitive firm is that the reason for it is different. Uh, with a perfectly competitive market space, what was happening before was since the product was homogenous and non-differentiable, you basically had a situation where if firms entered the industry, it would shift the supply curve to the right, which would lower the equilibrium price. The difference here is because firms are price makers, not price takers, they're not at the whim of the market in terms of what price they charge, they still have a downward sloping demand curve, which gives them a higher chance to be profitable. The problem is, is that if in a monopolistically competitive market, there's still lots of people that can compete with you. And while they might not have the exact same product, they can make it as closely as possible, like a generic brand of a certain product that you might use like mouthwash or something like that. They make it close enough in formula where basically charging a lower price, uh, some people will switch just because they'll be like, I can't really tell much of a difference. And so my demand for this product is going to be more elastic. So before you, if you have any elastic demand, cause you're like the only person making it or only a couple people are making it, then you have a lot more flexibility in terms of your price. But if you have elastic demand, because there's more competitors in the space, doesn't mean that your price is shifting the supply curve down and you're taking that price it just means that as the product becomes more elastic you have a little less flexibility in kind of charging whatever you want because if you charge too much then people will go to the other product and if you charge too little well then you might lose money and so the right side of this graph reflects that changing elasticity from the short run with the blue curve with the a demand curve to the b demand curve in the long run to the point where basically your average total cost is equal to your price at that new equilibrium. And so before in the short run, you were making more and your profit was that big green rectangle. But now in the long run, as elastic demand starts to kind of get in your way, your new profit maximizing level output is Q long run and your price is lower and it's equal to ATC. So you're making zero profits. Now, again, just like with perfect competition, you might have a situation where you're just kind of going back and forth in terms of periods in which you're making money and periods in which you're losing money. But overall, the assumption is that you're going to break even. So this is just a little bit of a graph that shows you or a table that shows you the differences between um, the short run and long run situations of uh, monopolistic competition. So again, in the short run, perf uh, monopolistically competitive firms are going to produce at the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And then basically your price is going to be determined by the demand curve at that intersection point dictated by where MR equals MC. 
Now, again, you would compare price to average total cost, and if you're making money, then price is higher than average total cost. If you're losing money, then price is less than average total cost. But that doesn't necessarily mean you should shut down. You should only shut down if there is a circumstance in which the average variable cost is higher than price. If average variable cost is lower than price, then again, those fixed costs will expire eventually, and then you'll become profitable or break even at that point. Um, in terms of the long run, so again, in the short run, we have a more inelastic demand curve because you've differentiated your product, but then as time goes on, there's more competitors who kind of approach your product. It's not exactly like your product, but it's close to your product. Then your demand curve becomes flatter, more elastic, and then you end up getting these zero profit outcomes in the long run, as indicated by that bottom row of graphs. Now, if we compare ourselves between perfect competition and monopolistic competition, again, perfect competition is profit maximizing at the point where price is equal to marginal cost because price is equal to marginal revenue. So it's the same uh, optimization uh, means to finding the answer, but because uniquely in a perfectly competitive space, marginal revenue is equal to demand, then we basically just do that. And in the long run, because of increased supply, which shifts down that price taking equilibrium price so that we end up making zero profits. On the other hand, we have a situation where marginal revenue equals marginal cost in the long run. And it's equal to ATC, price is equal to ATC in the long run. Um, so we still make zero profits and that's due to changes in elasticity. But really what this graph is focusing on is an efficiency question. So we've talked in this course about productive efficiency and allocative efficiency. So allocative efficiency is market equilibrium. Basically quantity supply is equal to quantity demanded. There's no wasted resources because we produce too much and there's no people left empty handed who are willing and able to pay the price. The other one is productive efficiency. We don't necessarily talk about this as, as much, but really here's where we can see it. In a perfectly competitive space, notice that the equilibrium point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost happens to be intersecting the average total cost curve at the lowest possible point on average total cost. So again, productive efficiency is producing a good or service at its lowest possible cost. So perfectly competitive markets are considered productively efficient because of the fact that they are producing at that lowest possible cost. But if we look at the graph on the right hand side with the monopolistically competitive firm, that is not necessarily productively efficient because of the fact that minimum ATC is well beyond the actual profit maximizing level of output that we have decided to go with. And so there is an element of market inefficiency and in a way market failure because of the fact that monopolistically competitive firms are not productively efficient. So perfectly competitive firms are productively efficient, monopolistically competitive and essentially every other market structure after this are not productively efficient. And so that's a loss of efficiency there. So that concludes our lecture on monopolistic competition. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And I wish you the best of luck on your assessments and any of the classes that you may have.